hosting this. Uh, it's, it's rare uh, in this day and age to see not only uh, people who are willing to look at every side of an important issue before they make a decision, but also elected officials who are willing to see all sides of an important issue sort of aired out so that we're all on the same page. No matter where you come down on this issue, uh, I think we all recognize that we're preparing to take a fairly drastic step if we take a step in this direction. Uh, even people who are in favor of it recognize that you know, we're talking about something fairly radical, fairly uh, of the moment. And uh, before you make a decision that important that's going to have that much impact throughout time, you ought to slow down a little bit and make sure that you've got all the facts that you need to make the right decision. So I appreciate all of you coming out to hear what we're doing here tonight. Uh, I've got my cell phone on vibrate and away from me so that I won't be distracted. I am very easily distracted, and I have this memorized from the beginning to the end, so if you can save all your questions, turn off your cell phones and not interrupt me, or else I'll have to start over. <laughs> so, so we're going to start with so the title. please turn your phones off. <laughs> please do. He's got to be out of here by 8. And I appreciate you letting us know that, Senator Martin, so that when you get up and leave, I don't think I offended you. <laughs> so an amendments convention, is it a solution or a seduction? Uh, and we're going to move forward a little bit here. Uh, Constitutional Convention, known by several names. Uh, a good abbreviation is CONCON. It's just shorter and faster to write and say. An Amendments Convention. Uh, or as it's become known uh, recently, Convention of States. Now, this is not a, uh, a title that I give much assent to. There's no such animal as a Convention of States. It is a Constitutional Convention. And I think that by the time I'm done with my presentation, uh, I will have made uh, a valid case for that, uh, to prove that point. Uh, also known as an Article 5 convention. An Article 5 convention movement, um, if we were talking about nobody but very conservative, God-fearing, patriotic, red-blooded Christian Americans sitting down in tea parties and dining rooms all across America to discuss what needs to be done, that's one thing. Uh, but when we talk about what's going on with the movement toward an Article 5 convention, uh, I want to demonstrate to you that that's not what we're talking about. So we've got Mark Levin uh, public, or, uh, authored the Liberty Amendments. Uh, I, I think Mark Levin is probably a stand-up fella. I've never met him, but I don't have a bone to pick with him other than a principled disagreement on this particular topic. Some other organizations that are in favor of this that are ostensibly conservative, good organizations in their own right uh, are Convention of States, Compact for America, Balanced Budget Amendment Task Force, and Middle, uh, middle Resolution. All of them, again, um, for the purpose of reigning in an out-of-control federal government. I don't think anybody here is willing to disagree uh, that we've got an out-of-control federal government trampling all over states' rights and individuals' rights. The question is whether or not Article 5, uh, the second provision within Article 5 for amending the Constitution, is the proper tool to rein in that federal government. On the liberal side of the coin, uh, there are others in favor of a modern-day constitutional convention, again known by a variety of names. So some of those organizations are Wolfpack, Alliance for Democracy, Center for Media and Democracy, Code Pink, Independent Progressive Politics Network, Progressive Democrats of America, the Sierra Club, Vermont for uh, single payer, uh, moveon.org, Green Party, and the Occupy groups, all in favor of invoking the second provision within Article 5 to have a modern day constitutional convention for the proposing of amendments. So, uh, my father was a simple uh, blue collar guy who liked to play cards. And when I was about eight years old, he taught me a pretty valuable lesson. He said, Son, when you sit down at the table to play poker, leave your money in your pocket. Look around the table and identify the sucker. If you cannot identify the sucker, leave your money in your pocket and get up from the table because you're him. Okay? <laughs> Folks, if we sit down at the table with moveon.org, we're the sucker. Here's the, here's the thing I've never been able to really get my head around when it comes to compromise in politics. Liberals sit on one side of the table, conservatives sit on the other side of the table, and they start compromising. Meaning the liberals get almost everything they wanted. The conservatives walk away shaking their heads wondering what the heck just happened. And this happens time and again. When you compromise 
with these people who have no principles and no love of the American way, you can't win. And then we've got elected officials at every level that never hold their ground. So one of the, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'll forgive me, one of the um, claims that are made by those in favor of an Article 5 convention is simply that uh, it has to be ratified by 38 states. Mitch, everything's going to be fine. Just do the math. Look at the map. You know, look at all the red states. But then I look at those red states, and I see them accepting Obamacare. I see them accepting money from bailouts, including Bush's $700 billion bailout. I see compromise and compromise and compromise. I see Supreme Courts at the state level and the federal level having to strike down unconstitutional laws that these very lawmakers wrote, argued, and passed. Bills that restrict individuals' liberty, bills that grow the size and scope of government. And I ask myself, does it matter to me that that's a red state? Can I trust them when they've compromised on every one of these issues that somehow magically, when it comes to not passing a bad amendment, they're going to hold their ground and not allow that to be passed or ratified? If that's true, I need an explanation for the 16th and 17th amendments from somebody somewhere. Bad amendments can absolutely be passed. So let's take a look before we go any further. I want to take a look at the text of Article 5 because if we're constitutionalists, and I – I almost hold the terms patriot and constitutionalist to be synonymous. They ought always to be synonymous. If you live in the United States of America and you call yourself a patriot, you ought to look to the Constitution to guide the direction of our politics and hold elected officials accountable to that Constitution. We have spent a lot of time as conservative constitutionalists decrying the actions of those on the other side of most of the arguments that we have, whether we call them liberals or socialists or progressives, whatever title we give them, we have roundly and rightly condemned them for playing fast and loose with the text of the Constitution, reading into it what they think should be there or what they wish was there, what they hope is there, what could be there. Instead of just looking at the text of the Constitution and saying, but here's what it says, this and no more. So if we found ourselves guilty of that very mechanism, how are we really any different than these people who we have rightly condemned for their political views? So let's take a look at the text of Article 5 in total. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments which, in either case, shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions and three-fourths thereof as one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. That's it. That's the entire text of Article 5. So what I want to do is examine each of those clauses and see which entity gets what power. We're going to start with state legislatures, the Congress, and the convention itself as a separate entity from either the state legislatures or the Congress, because the convention, when that 34th state puts in their call for a constitutional convention, convention of, uh, convention of states, Article 5 convention, whatever we call it, pink, twinkie, it really won't matter what we call it, when the 34th state puts in their Article 5 application, we're going to have a convention that is its own entity. So I wanted to list it here, and there's going to be a fourth entity that we'll list shortly, <coughs> but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. The Congress, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. So states have the power of applying to Congress for the convention, the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states. I keep hearing the phrase, call. States are going to call a constitutional convention. States are going to call a convention of states. States are going to call an amendments convention. States don't call anything. State legislatures apply under Article 5 to Congress 
to call a convention. Congress shall call a convention for proposing amendments. Congress calls the convention. That's what Article 5 says. Whether we like it or not, we have to accept the text for meaning what it means, or words don't have meaning. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, the Necessary and Proper Clause, which is a beast of burden that gets to carry everything else that nobody can find in the other part of the Constitution to carry, and I don't think that's fair, but the Necessary and Proper Clause does have its proper place in the Constitution. The Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution. All other powers vested by this Constitution. If the Constitution grants to Congress the power to call the convention, then who makes the laws regarding the convention? Well, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 says Congress does. The very people we're trying to rein in have the power to make the laws that will rule an Article 5 Constitutional Convention. So Congress calls the convention, they make the laws for calling the convention. Congress, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the state, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. Now that's important. The convention proposes the amendments. We saw six bills last year in the Virginia State Assembly, uh, to the General Assembly, to uh, call in one form or another, I think three of those were actual uh, applications and three were procedural, if my memory serves me correctly. Some of those procedural uh, bills attempted to outline what type of subject matter could be discussed at an Article 5 convention or how delegates would be chosen or what could be done if a delegate went beyond his mandate. None of the bills passed, and I'm glad they didn't. It wouldn't have really mattered if they had because it's not going to, the states aren't going to have control over that. Congress is going to make the laws regarding the, the uh, convention. And Congress knows this, by the way, and it will be one of the few powers that they exercise, and I'll demonstrate that shortly. But it's the convention that proposes the amendments. We don't get to package all of these amendments up and send them off with our delegates and say, now this is what you're going to propose, because then that's not a convention for proposing amendments. That's a convention for debating pre-proposed amendments. That's the first step of ratification, not the proposing of amendments. The Constitution says that the convention proposes the amendments. What amendments can they propose? Anything they want to. They can propose any amendment they want to. We can try to say, you're only going to address this, you're only going to address that. But in 1787, two-thirds of the New York delegation from New York walked away from the Constitutional Convention because they said the people back home didn't give us the authority to write a new Constitution. They only gave us the authority to propose amendments to the Articles of Confederation. This is way beyond that mandate. We're leaving, and we have a brand new constitution out of that anyway. Which shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states. So states have the power of ratification method number one, or by conventions in three-fourths thereof. So we're going to enter a fourth entity here ratification conventions. They don't even exist yet. But if Congress chooses to invoke ratification conventions as the method of ratifying any new amendments to the Constitution, we would have ratification conventions. Who will make them up? Who will choose them? Well, Congress has the power for making the laws regarding the convention, so Congress is not going to not have any power in not just choosing which method of ratification, but they're going to have some voice in how those ratification conventions are structured. I don't know who's going to be on those conventions if that's the method that we take. Do you? There's a big unknown and frightening, if you ask me, in this present day and age. Because, folks, this isn't 1787. I've looked around. We don't have the moral base that we had in 1787. Or we wouldn't be having this conversation. So ratification method number two goes to ratification conventions. As one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress. So Congress has the power to select either ratification mode number one or number two. Now, 
I don't know if you noticed this, but I'm watching the power stack up in all these different groups, and Congress has, so far, more of them than any of the other entities that exist as part of this program. The convention also has a power that is probably more frightening than any of the others so far. The convention itself, I'm looking at Article 13 of the Articles of Confederation. I was challenged on this recently, so I decided to put this slide into my presentation. Discussing the Articles of Confederation, it states, nor shall any alteration at any time hereafter be made to any of them, the Articles, unless such alteration be agreed in a Congress of the United States and be afterward confirmed by the legislatures of every state. So amendments to the Articles of Confederation required unanimous ratification. Our founding fathers changed that in the Constitutional Convention. Article 7 says the ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution. They changed it from unanimous under the Articles of Confederation, which by the way they could do because we weren't going to be under the Articles of Confederation anymore. They were proposing a whole new Constitution. And that new Constitution had a new method of ratification. Could it happen again? It absolutely could. Precedent says yes. The only precedent we have is 1787, and that's precisely what happened. So we have a brand new ratification process. What is that process? Who knows? Let's, let's discuss some possibilities. And I won't go far flung with this. Could it be that Congress just signs off on it? Could be. Could it be that a third of the states have to ratify it? Could it be that every state has to ratify it? Could it just be that President Obama has to sign off on it? Any of those things could be. And the worst of it is, it'll be considered by the world at large to be legitimate. And there won't be much we can do about it on that day because we have already allowed the, con the convention to be called and to create whatever it is they're going to create, a blank slate we're getting now. To put that in the form of a flow chart for those of you who think along the lines of file systems and everything, Article 5 gives us two methods for amending the Constitution. The first method, which we've used about a dozen and a half times, I know we've got 27 amendments, but uh, the first ten of those were done all at once, and then a couple of other times they were done in onesies and twosies. I think a total of 18 times we've actually amended the Constitution, and this is the method that we use. It passed through both houses, both the Senate and the House and Congress, by a two-thirds majority vote. And the Congress then decides whether it goes out to the state legislatures to be ratified by three-fourths of those or ratifying conventions to be ratified, ratified by three-fourths of those. Once that happens, it becomes part of the Constitution as if it had always been in the document. The second method is that two-thirds of the state legislatures, 34 states uh, in this given time, um, apply to Congress for a constitutional convention. Congress then calls the convention and sets the rules. The constitutional convention then proposes amendments sending those on because Congress gets to again choose the method of ratification unless that constitutional convention invokes its privilege to create a brand new ratification method. Congress would then uh, choose the ratification method. It would go to the state legislatures or the ratifying conventions. Three-fourths of each would have to pass it, but that's at the mercy of Congress. Folks, it is only at this level right here that Congress is no longer involved in this process. If that doesn't frighten you, I don't know what will. Congress is involved here. Congress is involved again here. Congress sets the rules for the convention going on here, and Congress gets to choose which method of ratification is going to happen. And if Congress chooses to go with ratifying conventions, Congress has a hand in that. This is not bypassing Congress. The people who've thrown us under the bus are licking their chops waiting for us to do this. This is Br'er Bear and Br'er Rabbit, if you maybe are familiar with the Uncle Remus stories? Let me see a show of hands. Who knows who Uncle Remus is? Okay, I don't have to tell the story then. <laughs> I'm so happy. But for those of you out in YouTube land, I'll tell it anyway. Uh, hmm. Uncle, Uncle Remus told these great stories of Br'er Bear and Br'er Rabbit, and arch enemies uh, growing up, uh, despising one another. Br'er Bear was uh, forever more after Br'er Rabbit because Br'er Rabbit was playing one prank after another on him. Well, in one of these stories, 
Br'er Bear gets his hands on Br'er Rabbit. And Br'er Bear, or Br'er Rabbit knows he's in trouble. Boy, I'm, I'm done for. So Br'er Bear starts going over all the different scenarios of what he's going to do to Br'er Rabbit. Br'er Rabbit says, well, you can do this and do that, but don't throw me in the briar patch. And Br'er Bear says, well, I'm going to do this and that. He says, well, don't throw me in the briar patch. Whatever you're doing, throw me in the briar patch. It finally sinks in. Br'er Bear thinks, oh, you don't want to go in the briar patch, huh? Throws him in the briar patch. What he doesn't know is that Br'er Rabbit grew up in the briar patch. He just runs out the other side. Br'er Bear can't get through the briar patch to get to him. End of story. Br'er Bear's mad all over again. It's a lot like Wile E. Coyote. But the point being, that's exactly the scenario we may be buying ourselves into here. Oh, don't make us have a constitutional convention because we don't want to do that. But the moment we hand them pen and paper, folks, they've pretty much got license to do whatever they want to do. Let's look at the claims of those who advocate for a convention. Using this as our backdrop, again, seeing all of the powers where they really lie, they claim states can bypass Congress in the amendment process. When I look, when I look at this and I see Congress calling the convention, making the laws for calling the convention, and selecting ratification method number one or number two, I don't see Congress being bypassed in this process. I see Congress having a very heavy hand in this. And in fact, it is well understood among a lot of constitutional scholars that an act, I'll tell you when this came up, several states attempted to pass legislation to say, okay, we have a constitutional convention, we're going to make it a felony for the delegate uh, to go out there and do something other than what we instruct him to do. And it has been well understood that those delegates would be protected against arrest during their time in the convention. They couldn't be recalled and arrested for voting this way or that way because they're exercising a federal duty. Because a, a constitutional convention is not an act of the states. It's an act of the federal government drafting a federal constitution. So they're not bypassing Congress in this process. So, well, states can propose amendments, but that's not what Article 5 says. Article 5 says that the convention is for proposing amendments. If the amendments are already proposed, I need to know the purpose of this convention. So states can propose the, amendment, uh, the, uh, the amendments. That one comes off the table, too. It's simply not the case. Well, states can make the rules for calling the convention. I think I've covered that one until I'm tired of hearing it. I don't know about y'all. But clearly, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 says that Congress has the power to make the laws for whatever else they are given the constitutional authority to do. Since it's a foregone conclusion that they're given the constitutional authority to call the convention, they certainly have rule over the convention. So states are not going to be able to make the rules for calling the convention. This is one of my favorites. It's not a constitutional convention. It's something that's much more limited in power. I'm going to address these in reverse order. Let's look at the constitutionally defined limits. Again, going by just the text of the Constitution. What can and what can't be discussed for amendment? At the very end of Article 5, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses of the ninth section of the first article, dealing with the importation of slaves. Well, since we're on the other side of 1808, and we don't import slaves anymore anyway, that comes off. Uh, we're going to say that restriction is lifted because it outlived its purpose. And that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Well, the 17th Amendment pretty much says that no state has any suffrage in the Senate. The people have suffrage times two in the House and the Senate. No state government is represented in the U.S. Senate anymore anyway. So that's a foregone conclusion that that's off the table. That's moot. Okay, so what's left? What can they not discuss for amendment? Nothing. Folks, they can do anything they want to do. They can discuss anything. And I want you to picture Nancy Pelosi sitting on one side of the table and Jeb Bush sitting on the other side of the table as they discuss a new amendment to the Constitution. And then ask yourself seriously, who's going to compromise? And what are we going to get out of that? Let's define a constitutional convention. Because I keep hearing convention of states, the reason they use the term convention of states, they will deny over and over in videos, on their website, in presentations, it's not a constitutional convention. 
Black's Law Dictionary is the most widely used law dictionary in the United States. The Supreme Court uses it, minor courts use it, judges use it, lawyers use it, law students use it. I'll bet Michael Ferris owns at least a copy of Black's Law Dictionary. The definition in Black's Law Dictionary, you can look this up online, this dictionary is free online. Constitutional Convention is a duly constituted assembly of delegates or representatives of the people or a state or of a state or nation for the purpose of framing, revising, or amending, emphasis mine, its constitution. So, a duly constituted assembly that addresses amending the constitution is called, legally speaking, a constitutional convention. What power does a constitutional convention have? Well, let's see. It can frame, revise, or amend a constitution. Our founding fathers got together in 1787 with very explicit instructions. Propose amendments to the Articles of Confederation. They decided to scrap the Articles of Confederation and write a whole new constitution. Am I glad they did? I sure am. I've read the Articles of Confederation. I think what we've got now is far superior to the Articles of Confederation. I think the founding fathers did the right thing. Did they have the strictest legal right to do so? I don't know, but I know they had every moral right to do it. Sort of encoded in our DNA and encompassed in the words of the Declaration of Independence, any people anywhere have the right to jettison a government that is destructive of their happiness and erect on its corpse a, a government more likely to affect their happiness. It's exactly what they did in 1787. They looked at the Articles of Confederation. They looked at how we had gotten our rear ends handed to us all through the war with England. And they knew that it was only by the grace of God that we had come out of that thing free. And they decided that we needed a stronger central government. I agree. I'm glad they did it. But the only precedent we have is a group of men going beyond their mandate, writing a whole new document. Who, if we do that today, who we got like James Mad or like Madison? Who we got like Benjamin Franklin? Who's our George Washington today? Folks, if we do that today, every partisan, every special interest group, every body is going to want to be at this thing. They're not going to be sequestered in a, in a location somewhere where they can argue in private and, and come out with their, their pride intact. This thing's going to be streamed live on YouTube. The delegates are going to be sitting there in the middle of it tweeting what so-and-so just said. It's not going to be what we had in 1787. To hope otherwise is vain. It is absolutely a constitutional convention, and it is not more limited in power than a constitutional convention. And why they continue to claim otherwise is absolutely beyond me. State voting power will be one state, one vote. I'd like to think that's true. Congressional Research Services, though, says otherwise. Addressing the 41 bills that have been introduced by Congress, they said, a portion of the convention delegates among the states was generally set at the formula provided for the Electoral College, with each state assigned a number equal to its combined Senate and House delegations. Meaning, in a nutshell, California is going to have a lot more votes than Virginia is. Who's comfortable with that? Because that's the way it's more likely to run. Could Congress change this? Yeah, absolutely. Congress can change this. But to just boldly state that it's going to be one state, one vote is hopeful thinking at best, at best, because it is at the discretion of Congress, the very ones that we're trying to rein in. Do you think they're going to give us the weapons to rein them in, or do you think they're going to stack the deck in their favor? To hope that state voting power be one state, one vote is wishful at best. So what about other dangers? Because there are other dangers. How about unintended consequences? Stuff you never saw coming. The 14th Amendment, for instance. Now, I think every thinking person who's ever cracked a history book understands that the 14th Amendment was written to say that because so-and-so was a slave last week, and now that there's no more slavery in the United States of America, he's a full citizen of the United States with all of the same rights as everybody else, and we need to move on. That is the intent of the 14th Amendment. 